sent yeah. a couple emails. All right, everybody. Hey, uh, this is Mirabon, and we're here with the legendary Gigi Fernandez, 17th time Grand Slam champion. It's always an honor to have her on uh, in any form of content that that we create, so or that, that I create. Oh shoot! All right, I think YouTube is going on right now. Give me one second. You have a delay. Yeah, but Gigi, feel free to, uh, you know, mention uh, what, you're doing, what you're up to. I like it. Um, well, I, contrary to what people may think, I'm actually really enjoying this hiatus. It's been really strange. You know, it's the first time in my life that I, I don't have to travel. Uh, I think this since 9-11, which was, what, 17 years ago, 2001, 19 years ago. Uh, this is the longest I've been without getting on a plane or going somewhere. Uh, but the difference is like, I don't have guilt, you know, I don't, have, it's like, not, not like I'm home and I feel like I should be going to do something or, you know, saying yes to another camp or a clinic or adding another special event or who knows, like I just, and because that's not an option. I don't have guilt about turning him down and I just enjoy um, being home with my kids and kind of being a normal person here in Florida, enjoying the weather. Um, and then, of course, I'm I am trying to pivot a little bit of my business to the online side, because the majority of teaching tennis, tennis is on it's live. It's on on the tennis court teaching y'all uh, camps and clinics and whatnot, and that has gone away. So I pivoted it a little bit to the online side, and I'm going through the hard learning curve of trying to sell products online, which sounds maybe easier than it is, but. Um, so yeah, I had a virtual volley or 10 steps of better volley last month. Uh, and then this month, of course, is the roadmap to mental dominance, which is what we're here to talk about. Sweet, uh, sweet, Gigi. So uh, again, you know, it's great to have you on. And I, I really love talking about the mental side of things because it's obviously where everything starts, everything begins, you know, starts with the, the proper mindset and the belief. And then that's when you start taking action. So I'm uh, really excited to get into uh, talking about really the system that you have uh, created for yourself and for many others uh, who have actually already been using it and having great success and to just dive into it and get some great tips for the audience to help them improve. Um, and then sure. we'll talk about, you know, your program as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Where do we awesome. start? Yeah. So, all right. So I, I don't know how deep you can get into this one, but I saw that on an email that you sent today, that you once got so mad that you mooned your opponent. <laughs> oh God! Uh, I don't know how no. much you want to chat about that, but um, I can chat about it because I mean it was just like a full moon, right? Basically, there was no—I don't think any skin showed, but okay. but I basically turned my back and lifted my skirt up, um, and I did it to Mary Pierce because she was just prancing around. She was winning six o five o or something like that, and she was still like pumping her fist and like in your face. And, you know, if you're beating somebody that badly, you just got to go quietly and just finish the mask, shake hands and go home. Right. You don't have to really rub it in. Um, so I didn't appreciate it. And, and I just did that. Um, you know, that was kind of, uh, unfortunately it was, I had a little bit of a um, wild temper, I guess you would say, you know, I, uh, I, you know, immaturity, uh, passion, and perfectionism was a bad combination. Uh, I'm a huge perfectionist, and when things didn't go right, I'm also very passionate, so I would get very angry, and I was too immature to, like, handle my emotions. So, um, so yeah, I would do things like that. Um, but that was early in my career, and then mm -hmm. later I obviously took control of my emotions and um, learned how to perform at the highest level. When the, when the most pressure was on is when I played the best. So I definitely um, was something that I learned. I, I was not born with it. So, and that's what I share in, in this product, the World Web to Antonominus, like kind of everything I did from A to Z, everything I did to go from that person that moons opponents and breaks 100 racks a year and paid more fines to the OTA than anybody in my, in my time to, you know, winning 17 Grand Slams. Yeah, I think that's really exciting for people to first off, right off the bat, just realize that, you know, it's something that you can actually train uh, and it's not something that you're just born with. So uh, that gives so a lot of correct. hope right there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, some people are born with it because I interviewed Martina in Brazil hmm. a couple of days ago um, and I asked her about her, her, how did she prepare for matches? And she went through this whole um, discussion of 
very specific from the physical perspective. You know, she would wake up early, warm up, do this, go to eat. It was all physical, no, nothing mental. So then when she finished, I was like, well, what about the mental part? And, you know, for her, it was so um, sort of ingrained or, or a natural gift that she was mentally tough that she didn't really work so much on it or she didn't really have to work so much on it until really later, way later in her career. Um, and for me, it was not like that. For me, part of a, de a definite part of my pre-match preparation was mental. I mean, at least half an hour to 45 minutes before all my matches, I during the day, maybe sometimes up to an hour, I would have spent you know, visualizing, meditating, breathing, and doing uh, concentration dr drills and just things from the mental side is what, you know, calming myself down and uh, et cetera. So for me, the mental preparation was way more important than the physical, uh, but everybody's different, right? Yeah, every everyone definitely is. And we all yeah. start somewhere and then progress. And so kind of a follow-up question before I kind of go in a more structured pattern and also we'll answer your, your questions, of course, is, um, you know, you mentioned playing Mary Pierce and, you know, she did certain things that annoyed you. Um, wh what, how did you approach these difficult and annoying opponents uh, later in your career versus that, that particular day where it really uh, threw you off? So I developed this mental technique called um, the little black box. So I had in my head, in my brain, I had this black box and it was made of steel and it had a, clamp and I would shut it. So any unpleasant thoughts or, you know, antics from the opponent or anything that was going on in my life, like my parents were going through a divorce uh, mm -hmm. while I was playing, anything that was upsetting, um, you know, breaks, breakups, you know, we have breakups, <laughs> you know, like yep. it's hard as you know, if you're ever, um, broken up in a relationship to, you know, that could happen the night before match and then you have to go play the next day and it's hard. And, and so this technique allowed me to put things in the box that, um, I would not allow to affect me during play. And, but it was also very useful with my partner did things that would annoy me, like um, miss easy balls. And, you know, I wasn't, I never got too mad at my partner, but once in a while, I'd be like, did you just miss that ball? He had set point, you know? <laughs> it's like, and I would just put it in the box. And, um, or my coach, I used to get really annoyed with my coach. I was like, you know how Andy Murray's always yelling at his, at his box? That was me yelling at my box. Um, but so I started putting things in the box and what was important about the box is that I would, after the match, I would go back and say, okay, what was in, what's in the box? What was annoying me? What was frustrating me? What, what do I need to deal with? What do I need to analyze and handle? Um, and I, then that's a good time to do it because that, at that point it's not affecting the outcome. The problem is uh, as tennis players, we get, it's a very emotional game, right? I mean, it's you versus me and it's like, uh, somewhat, somebody wins, somebody loses, and uh, there's no escaping it. You cannot be benched if you're having a bad day. You cannot have someone substitute you. Um, so you sort of out there on your own, and and you have to develop these little mental skills that'll help you perform better when the pressure's on. Good stuff, Gigi. So um, I appreciate that tip. So you you have your uh, the the, the roadmap to mental dominance program structured. Uh, into seven different uh, sections. And so I want to kind of hit on each of these, which I think will be really helpful uh, sure. to the audience. So the first part that you uh, talk about is the brain. And so I was wondering what happens to the brain when you're under pressure as opposed to when you're just in, in a normal practice? So did you get scared? I got scared. <laughs> See, when I'm in a room and I do that, everybody jumps, right? I thought there was a when fire. that happens, you you have a physiological reaction. Your body has a physiological reaction. And um, it's the fight or flight response, and it's something that you cannot avoid. When you're under stress, your body's going through the physiological response to the fight or flight. So you have muscle tension, you have butterflies in the stomach, you have uh, some people have tightness in the chest, you have dry mouth, you have the need to go to the bathroom, um, some people have nausea diarrhea um and again these are physiological reactions that you cannot change you cannot change physiology what, what was important is to understand what type of player you are because so, you know, what i say is some people fight some people fly some people um want to run away when you know when they see a bear in the woods and some people want to shoot the bear or fight the bear there's definitely two types of responses same same thing happens when you're playing like some people overplay the people who want to kill the bear are over aggressive over hyped and overdoing it generally trying to hit winners too soon and trying to go go for um low percentage shots finish the points too early get impatient 
Um, and then, then there are the people who paralyzed, freeze. That was me. I, I would get a severe case of left foot um, under pressure. My feet would just like, and I could not move. So then what you do is you tell yourself things to counter whatever it is that's happening. So for me, I was constantly telling myself triple time. You got to move your feet triple time. If you, if you think, when you tell yourself that you're moving your feet triple time, you're probably going half of one or half of one time, right? So yeah. you think quadruple time if you think you're, and then you might be at the right speed. So, um, and then if you're the type of player who overplays then you just got to chill out you got to relax and you got to just play at one point at a time. Mm, gotcha, Gigi. Um, so what should you do? Um, like say if you encounter situations where you're just like, really mentally super nervous like in that sort of case uh, and you're just overthinking like who you're playing that they're seated that there's going to be the crowd and all that like what types of things do you tell yourself in that situation or those situations well i mean the fact is that you can only in tennis play one point at a time you can only play the point that you're about to play and there's nothing you can do about the point that you just played that point's in the past it's already really one or lost it's already gone and there's nothing you can do about what happens at the end of the match you know, which could be two hours from now, right? So worrying about winning the match or losing the match when you're 30-15, you know, 4-1 in the first set, it's like, I know we all go there. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm upsetting this person. I'm up 4-1, you know, in the first set, and I'm going to get the first set. And next thing you know, um, you're thinking about something that's, you know, two hours from now, and you're, next thing you know, it's 4-all because you just got to hit of yourself. Um, and really the, all you can do when you're playing is try to win the next point. You know, that was kind of my mantra. It was like, I got to win the next point. I got to win the next point. I got to win the next point. If you could play, if anybody watching can go out there next time they go play a match and all you ever think about is I got to win the next point, nothing else, no judgment, no analysis of what you did right or wrong. And not, sometimes we get paralysis by analysis. We analyze so much. We're paralyzed. If you just think that I got to win the next point and figure out a way to win the next point and you do that for a two whole two set match, you probably play the best dance of your life. And that's uh, a pretty good thing to focus on because it takes, you know, when you're thinking about that, you're taking your mind of all the other things that you don't want to be thinking about. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic advice. I just recently heard, uh, it might have been yesterday, uh, the, the saying that uh, an inch is a cinch and a yard is hard, like something like that. But it kind of, you know, encapsulates what you just mentioned and just taking it one point at a time. So that's right. fantastic. Um, so what I really like about uh, the Roadmap to Mental Dominance is you also talk about setting goals. So with, with goal setting, that's something that a lot of us make mistakes on how we set goals and so forth. So I, I, I want to ask you that first off with that, which is um, what, what mistakes do people actually make when they're setting goals that we should be aware of? Well, the first one is they don't set achievable goals. You know, they, they set goals that are just not realistic and, um, or they don't set lo goals that are lofty enough that are not, um, you're not sort of uh, setting a goal that maybe you don't think you can achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my goals when I, um, first wrote on my goals, I think I was 22 or 23. And I just started working with this one coach. And one of the things I wrote was to win an Olympic gold medal and win a grand slam. And it's like, when I wrote that, it was like, this will never happen. <laughs> like, I mean, I was like a hundred in the world and, you know, never won anything in my life. And it's like, Oh yeah, what are we going to middle? Like really? There was even no Olympics yet. <laughs> you know, There's like an 84, the Olympics was a exhibition sport. And in 83, I'm saying, I want to win a gold medal. It's like very lofty, but, but if you don't set lofty goals and you'll never amount to anything, um, you know, and I think that the problem that the mistake people make really in their tennis careers is like, they don't set goals. They just don't mm -hmm. have goals. They're, you know, it's like, Oh, this is just my, the thing I play with, you know, it's like my, uh, my fun thing. Uh, and I don't set them, you know, and I, and, you know, I, I, I equate living life and, and, and I'm not just talking about tennis goals too. Like all the goals that I said were life goals, like physical, mental, spiritual, um, all these types of things. But I, I equate living life without goals, like getting in a car and starting to drive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aimless where driving. Are you where are you going? How do you know if you got there? Like you have to have a road, you have to have a map, you have to, know where you're going 
um, so you can feel good when you got there. And so even if it's, you know, like beat this person you've never beaten or win your regionals or win, go to nationals or, or, you know, in two years, be the best 40 and on 40 and over player in the country or be top 10 or uh, top 100, whatever it is, depending on your level. If you're two five, if you want to be a three oh in five years or two years or 10 years, whatever it is, you have to have a goal because otherwise you have to have something to strive for when you step on the court. Otherwise you just get stuck in quicksand and you never progress. 100% Gigi. You know, it, it's interesting because it made me think of, um, you know, certain people who set. This is not goals. water, by the way. Oh, what is it? I'm not telling, but it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Staying relaxed during this week. That's good. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so, <laughs> so Gigi, mm -hmm. as far as like, you know, it, it, what I was going to say is it makes me think of like certain people who have goals that, I mean, I hate to say it, but they seem like they're like really, really, really lofty. So how do you like know uh, when a goal is really unrealistic versus unrealistic. when it's, yeah, when it's. Okay. Really so, you know, I think no goal is not, like, I mean, if you like 3-0, you want to be a pro. Okay. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, but I mean, I'm kind of giving everything away that's in the product, but the way that I set goals, which is what's really, what's really critical to my success is that I would separate your goals by attainable and then seemingly unattainable. Hmm. Right. So the attainable, the attainable column, it's like, I know I can do this. I know that I can work out three times a week. I know that I can eat right. I know I could be healthy. I know I can hit a hundred bucket, of, you know, a hundred balls of bucket of serves three times a week. I know that I can run three miles five times a week, whatever it was. Those, these things I know I can do. I know I can probably win three tournaments this year, but I see me on the table would be win a grand slam, win 10 tournaments a year win the gold win a gold medal um be number one in the world those things i really truly seemingly unattainable when i wrote them um but because i wrote them because i had the attainable ones then i, I felt uh fulfilled and satisfied because i was achieving my goals and then these were just sort of over here you know i was still trying to strive for them but if i didn't achieve them it just wasn't the end of the world and I actually still have several goals in that seemingly unattainable pile that I'll never give up on like, I want to own a private island and I want to own a private plane. So nice. <laughs> and I wrote that, that when I was 25. So, and I'm, you know, four, uh, 55 now, 30 years later, it hasn't happened. I've flown a lot of private planes, but I, I don't own one. And, um, and I probably made the biggest mistake of my life when I retired. Uh, Mark Knoll's mom was a realtor and she was trying to sell me a five acre island in the Bahamas for half a million dollars. And I was like, I had it, you know, I just retired with all this money. Um, but I was like, yeah, I don't know. And I didn't do it. And it's probably worth $15 million now, you know, uh, <laughs> like 30 uh, years later. It happened. But, yeah. But someday, I mean, it could be like a half an acre Island somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And I'll someday, hopefully I'll achieve that. <laughs> I'm sure you will. You're you're very driven and accomplished. But uh, yeah. yeah and, and and Paul said, I think you should make a pro doubles comeback. You ever thought of that? <sighs> No. <laughs> okay, we won't we won't get you too nervous here. No, um, you know, I'm 55 years old. I'm out of shape. Um, but I have I have another life. You know, I have a mom of 11 year old twins. I mean, yeah. the level of intensity and the level of dedication that you have to have to be a professional athlete is very hard, kind of hard to comprehend for most normal people. I mean, it truly is 24 seven. It's all about you. There's like not one second that goes on that you're not thinking about yourself and what how you're gonna be better. Um, it's very self-centered and self-absorbed and, um, and that works in your twenties. Um, but it doesn't work anymore, you know, and, uh, not at this stage of my life. So, so yeah, that's a big fat no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a, a great question from Jordan. Uh, Lebo, which, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that Jordan, but, uh, classic one, really, how can I play the same way in a match as I do when I this hit with somebody, what do you think as you sip the summer drink? Well, I mean, the, you, you have to have, you have to follow the roadmap to mental dominance to be real. I mean, you have to understand your brain. You have to know what's happening to you when you pressure and you have to have strategies to counter what's happening to you under pressure. You have to have goals for that match that you try to achieve. If you achieve the goals within that match then you're more likely to win than you just go out and play and, and hope to win. Like a goal can never be to win. That can never be your goal when you go out and play because that happens two and a half uh, hours from now. 
um, then you have to have pre-match preparation, which I think tenant, recreational tennis players are the worst of, about getting prepared for matches. Um, they don't have any forced thought. Some of them show up, you know, the matches five minutes before they start or, you know, 10 minutes before they start and they run around. Or even the ones that have time to hit a few balls, there's just really no, like, pre the day before, the week before, like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And then once you get into the match, what are you doing with all that time in between points? Do you have, like, a set routine, what I call the crave sequence? You know exactly the steps you need to take between each point with, from the time the point ends to the time the point begins. In my opinion, 90% of 95% of tennis is decided in this time, in the time between points, because that's where you can just self-sabotage. And, um, and then, of course, you have to have trigger words, which if you don't know what those are, then you will never play in a match as well, Jordan, as well as you do in your matches. And then you have to have a bag of tricks, that what I call the mental toolkit, a bag of tricks that you can pull on when things aren't going well. There's 13 things that I give you that you do when things aren't going well that hopefully get you back on track. Um, and things, six of those are things you work off, off court things, you know, like meditating, breathing, visualization, concentration, your self-talk, uh, finding your happy place, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to have all these like uh, mental skills so that you can play as well as you do in practice. Otherwise you're just kind of throwing a dart and hoping that it happens. Yeah, I love it, Gigi. And we've got Howard here who says, I stress to my teams that achieving performance goals will likely lead to reaching outcome goals. So you agree that with that? Out. Oops, here it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it's like, it's about how, what can you do in the moment? Like, how can you perform? If you get three, if you get three out of four first serves in, if you hit all your returns in the court, if you move your feet, if you hit, you know, every ball across court, if you, whatever your game plan is, if you, ex, you know, if you try to execute it as best you can, then you, you probably have good results, which is the outcome goal, right? Um, so being present oriented and being process oriented and not so worried about the wins and the losses or letting your teammates down, letting your partner down, but more about how do I start this match and how do I get into match, my play, match playing mode as soon as possible? You know, sometimes we start out and we're relaxed. And um, for Jordan, I'm sure there's matches when he went out and he played great. And then other times you go out and you're like, ah, oh, I just don't feel good. And then what are you telling yourself those times to get to the point where you're like, oh, I feel good now, right? Because it doesn't matter how you start a match, only how you finish. And then when you're starting to play, how quickly do you get into that mentality of, um, I call it like when you find yourself, like, oh, here I am. I, I'm fine. My game is finally here. You know, I'm finally relaxed. I'm finally uh, playing. I'm enjoying it. And uh, sometimes it takes two games. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it takes a set and a half, you know, and sometimes it never comes. But, uh, you know, the, the true champions and the true greats of whatever level are the ones that, and, and I'm not talking about pros. I'm talking about even the best four O's and the best four fives are the ones that are able to find a way to win when they're not playing at their best. And their self-talk um, is such that it allows them to continue to um, strive to that, to that moment when they finally have found themselves playing to their capacity or their, to their capability at some time during that, during that match. Yeah, awesome advice here. Appreciate that. So uh, let's see. Uh, I have a question and then I'll get to another question that we received here. Um, so I'm excited to, to kind of find out a little bit about your particular pre-match routine. So, you know, just take it back for us again into like maybe Grand Slam Final or any yeah. tournament that you can think about. And then like, what are some things that, that you did before a match? Yeah, so pre-match preparation start, started sometimes years before match, like I was trying to win Wimbledon, like I must have visualized winning Wimbledon 10,000 times in my head before I actually went to play Wimbledon uh, final, or before I actually won the Wimbledon uh, title for the first time. Um, you know, the, it, pretty much preparation, to me preparation was everything. And it was funny, Martina said exactly the same thing. Um, if you're well prepared for your matches, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, when you walk out on the court, then you just let your game come out. You know, and everybody, and even if you're not a world-class player, like, you know what your best level is, right? So if you prepare, if you do, you know, the right preparation leading up to that match, um, there, there will be days where you play great and there will be days where you don't. 
what I tell players is um, if you ever play a match and for some reason you're like, wow, I played really well today. Everything was clicking. Everything was great. Go back and analyze the last 24 hours. Mm. What did you do the last 24 hours? Where did, what did you have for dinner? What time did you go to bed? How many hours sleep did you get? What did you eat for breakfast? How did you drive to your, you know, did you, what did you do? Um, and repeat it. Next time it was exactly the same thing. And hopefully you play well. You might not, but you're giving yourself a better chance of, of playing well the next time as opposed to, you know, like maybe that morning you were nice and relaxed and you drove slowly and you weren't stressing out and, uh, and you played really well because you were calm, cool, and collected. And then the next time you were like running to your match and like you're so frantic because there was traffic and you have to stop mm -hmm. and get gas for your car, which um, you should never do on the morning of a match. Um, and then all of a sudden you don't play well. Well, sh hello, <laughs> you know what I'm, what I'm saying? So next time go back and do what got you to, uh, to play well at one time. Yeah. And that's why we see all these top pros, like with their relentless routines, obviously everybody thinks about Nadal, uh, having the yeah. same exact things, you know, that he it's, does. You yeah. got to control the controllables. You know, there's so much that's out of our control in tennis, um, that we're just very, uh, particular for lack of a better word. I didn't want to use the other word that I was thinking because it's maybe not a, not a nice word, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, but we're very like, like oh, yeah. angel retentive, right? There you <laughs> go. The there I'm you go. Think of. Nice. Just add but a you word. Have to be, you have to be. You kind of have to be that way too. I'm not suggesting that people out there do this, but if you're trying to play tennis at that level, um, you have to be to the nth degree, um, pre plan and routine. But for people watching, some some version of that would definitely go a long way. Awesome, Gigi. So this one is actually a two-parter, and it's it's it morphs into a mental game question at the end. So I'll, we'll see what you think. But uh, this is the first part. Uh, hey, Neil. So what is your take on Craig O'Shaughnessy's stats about the first four shots? I know it's important, but how do you tell a relatively good twelve and under player that they need to focus more on the first four shots? And then the mental part is surely hours and hours of drilling can't be left out this must be good for mental toughness as well so do you have any thoughts on this yeah um those the statistics of the first four shots in tennis are for professional tennis players right um you know 12 and under a u12 um junior is probably not finishing the points in the first four shots because they don't have the power um and the accuracy of a pro so i would think those statistics are fairly different the hours and hours and hours of practicing are a must because you have to have the um, kind of automatic brain, uh, muscle memory um, mm -hmm. that you develop as a junior where you hit thousands and thousands of balls and you don't get to a point where you don't really think about your strokes anymore. It just sort of happens. Um, so so I think that four, first four shots um, is take it with a grain of salt for a, for a kid developing because you still have to learn how to construct a point have a rally, you know, move your opponent around, find the right time to go for the winner or come in. Um, I don't think we see like huge serve, forehand, put away, return, you know, next ball winners in the 12 and under. So you didn't know like, me, Gigi. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what that? I didn't know you. <laughs> 12? Maybe at 15 or 16, but I don't know about 12. I mean, that's still like, I mean, yeah. The one percent of the one percent maybe are doing that, you know, the ones that yeah. are going to become Roger and, and Novak. But most of us mere mortals are not doing that. Yeah, no, hundred yeah. percent. Totally joking here. So, uh, so Kevin has a, a, a good question, uh, another classic one. So uh, this is a question for uh, Kevin's daughter. She tends to get very nervous in a match, especially when she is winning and starts to make mistakes. I've, I've done this as an adult actually, but how can I help her to stay focused and not play nervous? So, you know, this is pretty funny. I'm going to tell you what my dad did, which is kind of brilliant on his part. I don't know. I think it was an accident that he did this, but when I was uh, 12 or 13, I started to feel nervous on the court and I, uh, it was, I only felt nervous when I came to the United States to play um, in junior USD and nationals at home. I was never nervous. I was calm, calm, calm. So what my dad did is he gave my mom some pills, some magic calming pills. I see. And he gave my mom, you know, if Gigi gets nervous, 
give her one of these pills and tell her that this is a calming pill. Well, it was like a baby aspirin, mm. right? But I didn't know that. So whenever, you know, so I, so I would say to my mom, oh, I, I don't feel so good. She's like, here, take this pill. It's make you feel better. And I would take the pill and then I come up to the match and she's like, how'd you feel? I'm like, oh my God, that pill really worked. <laughs> you know, I was not nervous, right? <laughs> so, so there you go. It's like tricking the mind into, uh, mm. Into thinking what it, so I would say to Kevin, try that with your daughter. I don't know how old she is, but you can. They, there is that out there, beta blockers, and there's all these things that are actually. Uh, I don't know if that's legal. Or, I don't know if beta blockers are legal. So don't give her beta blocker. What I'm saying is, you do a placebo, right? You just give her a little baby aspirin, but you tell her, you know, I, I talked to my doctor, and he recommended that you take this for your matches so you don't get nervous, and see how that plays out. Yeah. And do you think that maybe uh, Kevin could talk to his daughter and just try to stress that, Hey, you know, I'm not so worried about the wins and losses now. And it's really about your long-term development. So don't worry, yeah. just focus on the process. So a lot of the stuff that you said before too. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, as parents and I'm a parent, so I can give you parent, parent, parenting advice, parental yeah. advice. Not that I think that you want that, but I have a daughter who's a very good soccer player. Nice. Um, and you're constantly, um, all you can really do with your kids is support them and love them and, um, you know, help them in whatever way you can so that they find them their happiness, you know, and if, if she's happy on the court and that's what she wants to do, um, just being there for her and being supportive of her, um, will, will help. And, and the other thing, and again, I mentioned this already, but I'll mention it again to stay focused and not play nervous. It's like, just, keep winning, keep trying to win the next point. Mm -hmm. Tell her like, just go out and try to win the first point. When you win or lose that point, you try to win the second point. Win or lose that point, you try to win the third point. And then you just keep playing a bunch of points. And in the end, hopefully you win the last point, right? But that's really the way to look at it. It's just another point. Listen to this, the, you know what percentage of the points the number one tennis player in the world wins? Whoever's number one at the time. Right now it's Novak, I believe. So what percentage of the points does Novak win? Yeah, it's like 52, 54, something like that. Something like that, like 54%. Yeah. Right? So so, so he's only winning you know, four or five or six more points than his opponent, or eight to be exact. But if you're ta if you're winning 52% or 51 and a half, between 51 and 52% of the points, of all the points you play, you're top 10 in the world. That means that's same with your level. So if, if you're 3-5 and you win 55% of all the points that you play, you'll be the best 3-5 in your league. So you don't have to win... <laughs> you only have to win a few more points than your opponent. I mean, there are matches where you win more points than your opponent, you lose the match. And there are matches where you win less points than your opponent and you win, right? So it's it doesn't matter. Like, it just matters when, you know, when you win the points, right? Obviously, the game points and the, uh, the break points. And, you know, what I tell people, a little mental tip, when they're not playing well in the big points, is I just tell them to reverse the score. So... If it's 30, 40 and you're not playing that point well, then you just tell yourself it's 40, 30 and you have to win the point to uh, stay in the game. I like that. That's excellent. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Oh, good one. So Catherine, hey, Catherine, uh, she asks, what do you say to your partner if she is being negative in her thinking? Okay, well, she must be negative in her talking because unless Catherine can read minds, <laughs> never know. I don't think she can be negative with her thinking. Um, so if a partner is being negative, and, you, and I'm kind of giving you a hard time, Catherine, but you can kind of tell by the droopy shoulders and like being down on yourself and maybe saying things to herself that are negative. I mean, all you can do with your partner is support them and try to be upbeat and positive with them and nice. You know, I always tell players. There's a lot you can do to make your partner play worse, but there's nothing you can do to make them play better. They have to play better themselves. They're, if they're not uh, playing well, the only ones that can snap out of it is them. If you support them and you're nice to them and you're encouraging and you say nice things, their game's going to come around quicker than if you are negative or say things like, do you always play this bad? <laughs> I've had people tell me that someone said that. Really? Like, That's brutal. Yeah. Yeah, it's brutal. Dang. Um, so what you say to your partner is, you know, negativity. Well, first of all, I would put it in the box. I would put that thought in the little black box. And and I, actually, I would not try to help her. I, there's, again, nothing you can do for her. She has to do it herself. 
Um, don't judge her. Don't tell her not to be negative because when you're being negative, you don't want anybody telling you not to be negative. Um, so, so yeah, stay positive. Cool. cool, cool, awesome. Let's see what else we got. I know we've got quite a few questions here. Uh, okay. Oh, good one. Hi. What is the hey Gary? What is the best way to mentally overcome all the bad feelings after losing uh, an important match? Ooh, I, I, we talked about this actually a little bit last week. Uh, Federer once said he tries to follow the 24-hour rule, learn the lessons, and let it all go in a mere 24 hours. Wow, that's, that's, 24 hours is a long time to, to move over a match. Is that how long <laughs> it takes him to get over a loss? Well, it depends on the loss. I mean, I bet you that Matt, that the Wimbledon final last year, uh, he's still not over. I'm sure he has not recovered from that. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine, right? Some, some matches just have more meanings than others. But with Gary, um, uh, you know, I used to mow for a day or two. I don't know that I stuck to a 24-hour rule. Um, you know, a lot of times um, I was playing singles and doubles. So usually my moping came, came around my singles losses because I, I didn't lose that much in doubles. And then I had a doubles match to play, so I had to, like, quickly focus my attention on that. So I think the best way to get over – a loss is to get back on the court as soon as possible, you know, go play another match. Um, sometimes that's not possible, but even if it's a practice match or a practice set. Um, and I like the hard, I like the 24 hour, um, at least, you know, maybe not the next day, but by the following day, you should be, uh, you should be done moving. Um, because in the end that finished, right. The other thing, the other um, thing that I used to do after losses is really kind of sit down and analyze why you lost. Like what happened? What truly happened? Like, did you did you get beat or did you beat yourself? Did you did a stroke break down? Did a you know particularly shot not come through? And then the next day, I would for sure go work on whatever it was that didn't work in that match. So um, that was a good way to start to get over it because if you're if I know that I lost a match because my serve let me down, then I would go hit a bucket serve. If I know I lost a serve because I got tired, then I'd go run three miles. Um, and then you kind of start feeling better about yourself and moving on. Love it. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. You know, we, lately well, when I've lost, I just use it as motivation. You know, it's so important to reflect. I mean, even just like weekly reflect on what's going on, your progress mistakes. And then, yes, uh, you well, this know. is part of goal setting, you know, cause when you, when you have your goals, you, you review them every three to six months, you go through them and you like like you said progress how are you doing like how what's happening what do i do to keep working on what's good what's bad what's in progress and you kind of put things in their little section okay this stroke is good this stroke is work this stroke is uh horrible right and focus on uh, all three when you're practicing but maybe spend more time on the one that's horrible than it is on the one that's already good that's right that's right for sure appreciate that Ooh, mark more comments here and questions so david hello david People frequently say they don't play the same or play as well in a match compared to practice. Do you think people are hitting as well ah. in practice as they think? <laughs> uh, they are. No, I have seen. Yeah. I mean, I have to agree with this one. Like I used to coach uh, when I was at Chelsea Pierce, three, five, four, four, five, and I used to go watch it play. And sometimes the people that were watching, that I was watching play, it was like, who are those people playing? <laughs> Because they look nothing like we did on the court yesterday. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I think that I think that people do play worse in practice in matches they do in practice again because they don't get prepared. They don't understand their mental part of tennis. They're just all it's all physical. And if you can have all the strokes in the world in practice, you can be great. If you don't have if you haven't mastered the mental side of the game, um, you're never going to play well. I mean, tennis is 85% mental, let's face it. Like when you're playing a match, 84% of the time that you're playing a match, you're not playing a point. Okay, that's statistics from the uh, us, from the um, tours. Like in its average match, uh, pros are not playing 84% of the time. So we can say it's more or less for recreational players. I don't know. We probably don't take as much time in recreational tennis between points, or sometimes we take longer. So let's say it's 75% or 90% or – or even if it was 60%, right, which is low. I think it's way more than 60% that you're not playing. But when if you're not playing a point, what's happening? You're in your head. That's the mental part of the game. So so what are you doing? It's 84% of the time. How much time are you spending working on the mental part of the game? And the answer for most people is zero 
Mm-hmm. And for some, it's like, oh, five or ten percent, or I do a little breathing, or I meditate here and there. But it really, should be like a lot because it's so mental, right? So, so that's why you know that's why I put this product out because there's people want to work on the mental side of the game, but they just don't know how. It's like, what do you? How do I do it? What do I do? Okay, well, here's your roadmap. Like one to seven. Here's seven things that uh, seven areas that you got to focus on, and each area has like you know a four, five, or ten sub areas, and and if you learn these things and you practice them, I can guarantee that you'll play better in matches. I 100% guarantee that if you work on the mental part of the game, you will play better in your matches. And if not, you get your money back because I have a 30, well, it's a 30 day money back guarantee, but it's really a lifetime guarantee. Like if this thing didn't work for you, um, then I want to know about it. I want to know because it's, and I'm happy to return your money. So um, because yeah. I know that it works, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, learning from the best, uh, you can't get much better than this, you know, 70 time grand slam champ. And yeah, I mean, you know, my, my quick take on is it is that I, I see people in practice, they're really not playing intensely, uh, you know, for, for a large part of us. And, and we're not, uh, just, uh, you know, really focusing as much in practice. And then when we get to a match scenario, like we're not practicing the proper mental techniques and preparation and, you know, the, the seven right. uh, steps that, uh, that Gigi's going to teach you about. And then, right. then we're just like in a new environment and we don't know what to do. So, and you're free. It's like, Oh my God, now I gotta, I mean, I gotta make this forehand, like you said, because the intensity is not there in practice. So a lot of it is how you practice. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, let's see. We've got a, a comment. Misses don't count in practice when they're missing a match is what counts. Yeah, that's true. Misses don't count in practice. That's true. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, we've got an age comment here. I won't go but, there. But remember, David, they count to a certain degree but because you only have to win 54% of all the points you play. So you don't. it's okay to miss. You've got to miss. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if you miss. I promise you it doesn't matter. Like, mm-hmm. just keep playing. Just keep playing. The only time it matters if you miss truly is on match point. Other than that, you still got another chance on the next point, and you still got another chance on the next point. So it just doesn't matter, really. For sure. In the, for sure. In the end, the whole scheme of the match, right? Missing one ball does not matter. Yeah, no, totally, totally. And and let's see. So Catherine, uh, back to the question here. Is it better in w- the warm-up to show your good shots to your opponents or to go easy and not let them know you have an excellent overhead and then bam, you just um, – You know, there's a little bit of um, um, <laughs> mental uh, – what do you call it? It's not gamesmanship, but um, – Mind games? You know, the, the thing is like – that's a hard question for me to answer because I knew everybody I played against, you know? So like I was never, the, my warm ups were strictly like, okay, so let's just talk about the warm ups. It's actually, that's one of the, um, the pillars of the match, like your match mentality and the warm ups included in that. Um, that your warm ups are really used to assess your opponent. Like you're really trying to learn from as much as you can about your opponent because you probably have never played against them most of the time recreational tennis. So a lot of times we go out and play people we have never played before. So you're trying to like gather information. So it's not so much about your warm up, but it's more about what can I learn about my opponent? Because uh, I need to know their weaknesses so I can attack them. Um, so I would say just, you know, do your warm up. Um, don't, you know, don't not hit your shots because you don't want them to know that they're good because then when maybe when they come, you haven't warmed it up, right? So, uh, so that's a tough one. You know, I, um, you know, again, the warm ups are just to warm up. I try not to give the warm ups too much importance. Um, you know, I played great matches and had terrible warm ups, and I played terrible matches and had great warm ups. So, just kind of take take the warm ups for just what they are, which is that you're you're maybe the only time you have to analyze your opponent. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the main function of it in my book too. Uh, I definitely want to warm up beforehand as well, and not just jump in there cold. Um, right. All right. So let's see, Samantha. Speaking of checking in with your goals, how about when you're basically starting over each summer when you're not able to play as much in the winter? Oh, that's a bummer. Think? Um, yeah. well, I mean, what I would do in the winters is I would work on your fitness, you know, like go to the gym and c- keep your body in shape and work on the mental game. You know, we can work on your breathing techniques and your visualization and your, um, maybe learn to meditate, learn, work on concentration. 
maybe find a sport that you can do inside that complements tennis, like maybe playing some basketball, I don't know, um, or maybe um, doing some aerobic, that's how it's right, aerobic dancing, or I don't know, something. Something that's footwork oriented, um, barre class, I don't know. Um, boot camp, you know, do some boot camp in the winter. So, you know, I, I, my answer to this is like playing tennis is like riding a bike. You don't forget it. So you should um, come back within a week or 10 days of coming back in the winter, in the summer. You should have your same form that you had at the end of the uh, previous summer, right? So it doesn't d disappear. It just maybe takes a little bit longer to get um, back in your same form, but it doesn't definitely does not go away. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And also, I mean, you can even like work on your, your tennis in the respect of like shadow swinging uh, as right. well. And, and then, yeah, like, the wall. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's always yeah. ways to, to improve. And like, I mean, mentally, like, like Gigi said, is just like really the biggest uh, in my yeah. book. So, uh, let's see what we got here. The next point is more important than the last mistake. That's a good one. Uh, Doc Martin, I guess, is who said that. So Gigi, um, I want to talk, uh, well, ask you about, um, you know, the roadmap to mental dominance. Cause obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this program because it's, again, it's coming from somebody who, uh, has been through it all has, has been super successful, but even, you know, remember that Gigi also, you know, she came from a place of having trouble with a mental game earlier on, like many of us. And then she gradually learned and figure out, figured out a great system that propelled her to uh, just an uh, incredible career, you know? So uh, what can we expect from the roadmap to mental dominance? Yeah, so like you mentioned, it has seven pillars um, and each pillar, the pillars are the brain, the, your goals, your uh, match mentality, or pre-match pre preparation is third and match mentality, which is, you know, how, what do you think about a match? It's like, what's, what's, how much risk do you take? And it depends on you and your opponent. And how do you play the big points? And what are the big points? Um, then we have the crave sequence, which is what you do in that 25 seconds that I talked about is so critical. Uh, and then the sixth one is the trigger words, which you have to have to perform under pressure. And then the, your mental toolkit. So there's probably, I think it's 46 videos and they're somewhere for, from, you know, three to eight minutes each video. And I go over every every one of the um, pillars at length. Um, it also, for this product, comes with a GG Method Dose Instructional Program for free. So you're also getting, or included in the $97, you get the, whole, the full GG Method, which covers um, the five steps of the GG Method. Positioning, core coverage, serve strategies, return strategies, and shot selection. If anybody out there already has it, like I did have a person that already had the G method that wanted to buy the roadmap, so I give them a thirty dollars discount. So hmm. um, just email me, gg at gg Fernandez Tennis. You can get that for sixty seven dollars instead of ninety seven if you already have, if you already bought the G method from me. Um, and then um, and the seven day at home practice program. So I recently had the uh, ten steps to a better volley, to a perfect volley program came out, and I did a seven day at home because we're in this situation when I released it where you couldn't really leave your house. So, uh, so some, you know, practice techniques and volleys against the wall and working on your split step and working on your recovery step and uh, working on your turn and things that you could do uh, against the wall to help your body. So that's also included in the program. Um, so it was $250 last year, this year, our times are different. So it's $97. I have a payment plan. I just added a payment plan. So it's three payments of thirty-three or thirty-two dollars. If you don't want to pay the ninety-seven at once, um, and you know, like um, it's been a rough three months. Um, you know, like I was telling Marban before the years before the uh, session started. Uh, I don't. Um, my the main part of my business is my camps, my clinics, my life at home, my life events where people come play with me or with me or the grant. You know, have to cancel Wimbledon, cancel Labor Cup. Uh, cancel the Miami Open, can, you know, hopefully the U.S. Open goes on, but I'm not feeling so so strongly that it will. Yeah. Um, I've canceled all my eight, March, April, May, June, July, or June is just all canceled. Um, so it's hard. It's hard to um, uh, stay afloat. You know, I'm taking advantage of the uh, Small Business of the CARES Act and, you know, have a small business loan that supposedly is approved, but I have not see any of that and um you know and like you do it's tough time you know I, I had to lay off all my employees including my sister that was really hard um oh. 
So, but you know, you, you kind of do what you do. So if you can, afford, if you can spend, you know, spend $33 for the next three months, that'd be great for me. And I would, I would really appreciate it. And, um, uh, I would really be very thankful. Um, and hopefully some, we need some somewhere along the way, you know, my camps are really fun. Uh, I, I keep them really small, 16 people. They're not that much more than, you know, going to Saddleborg or going to the IMG Academy or going to any of the other camps out there. Um, but you learn doubles. Like this is by far, I mean, I can brag about my doubles camps because I know that these right. are the best doubles camps in the world. Uh, you will learn more about those um, than you do uh, anywhere else. So, so thank you for watching. Uh, thank you, Arvon. I don't know if, if there are any more questions or, um, yeah, there are a couple. I, and I just want to stress too for everybody. I mean, like I, I think this is like amazing value because you're getting not only the roadmap to mental dominance at a reduced price of 97, but then you're also getting the GG method, which GG has sold for like also like it's equivalent or more than, than uh, this particular program, the roadmap to mental dominance. Uh, and then you get the seven day at home volley practice program. And uh, I think also a Q&A call, right, Gigi, as well? Yeah. We're having a next Thursday, the 28th live um, Zoom call. So hopefully it will be on video so I um, I can I'll take live questions like I am talking to you. I, depending on how people sign up for or show up for that, it could be a bit, a bit much. But everybody's going to be on and everybody's going to be able to ask questions. And if we have too many people, I'll do another one and make sure that everybody gets their own specific questions answered. Awesome, Gigi. I love it. And uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to a couple of questions if you can, Gigi. We've got one yeah. from Mustafa. You have to at seven, right? So we got like five more minutes. I do. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be okay. So uh, yeah. let's see. So Mustafa, how do you build motivation for a match that you know you should be easily handling so that you're efficient and don't make it a prolonged battle? Good one. Hmm. So like, let's say maybe you know you're supposed to beat somebody properly but you know you maybe you don't want to overestimate well, it's not a good way of looking at your matches you know I, I know that when roger goes to play i don't care if he's playing the guys ranked 150 in the world he doesn't go out thinking that he should beat them efficiently and mm. not you're right i mean that's not a good way to be thinking about a match um you always have to expect a battle i don't care who you're playing even if you're playing the worst player on on the team and you're the best player on the team and you're playing a 3-0 and you're in your 3-5 you know, you cannot think about tennis that way because there's no shoulds. Like, you shouldn't beat anybody. Like, you just have to go out and, and battle. And, and they could have their best day ever. You could have your worst day ever. And now you're in a battle, right? But you don't want to put that kind of pressure on yourself where you're thinking, I have to finish this fast. Uh, because then it's for all and you're like, ah! <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. I would change the way of thinking. I mean, you really wanted to, even for Natasha and I, we were number one in the world and destroying everybody. Like, you know, first second round matches, we would. Ne I mean, we never lost before the semifinals of the Grand Slam ever, or maybe even the finals. Um, but we took those first and second round matches just as intensely as we did the finals. It's like we got a match here, and we got to be intense, and we got to just like you know, be the same way as if we're playing a final, because uh, otherwise, before you know it, you're like struggling, right? Because <laughs> you. Uh, under, underestimate your opponent. So never yeah. underestimate your opponent and never think you're better than someone. Just go out and play. Yeah. Execute the game plan. Love it. Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, Walter, how do you forget being up 40 love on your ah! serve and up 5 2 in the match <laughs> and lose a set 7 6 in doubles? How do you forget that? What do you do? In doubles or in singles? Um, <laughs> that's hard. You know, that's really hard. And that's a, the true test of a champion. Yeah. Um, and we see pros do it all the time, you know, like they lose first set and, and all of a sudden that this happens, but then they come out and they're fighting again, but it goes, it comes back to playing one point at a time. Right. So if you're start second set, it's like, forget you lost the first set. It doesn't matter. That's over. Now you got to try to win the second set. So, I mean, it's not easy. Um, put it in the box, detach from the outcome, do a little breathing, meditation, visualization, like sing songs in your head anything to forget leave the court i would leave the court if this is if this happened i would leave the court and go to the bathroom mm -hmm. i used yeah. to go to the bathroom like all the time and and you know what's funny like i just learned 
when I was researching the the this roadmap to mental wellness, when I was starting to put it together, and I was researching, you know, what happens to a brain under pressure, like what, like I really went to the scientific side, like what's happening, why was I, what was I feeling, why was I feeling these things, and then that's when I learned about the fight or flight or fight or flight response, um, which is a physiological response, like we discussed earlier, but the need to go to the bathroom is a physiological response from stress. That's why, like, some people, like, uh, if something really bad happens, you know, kids pee in their pants or some people pee in their pants when they're about to, you know, like, yeah. I'm sure you've read stories about that. It's your body's physiological reaction. So so I didn't know that when I had to go to the bathroom, it was a physiological. So I used to have to go to the bathroom for every match. And a lot of times I used to go to the bathroom between matches. And mm. usually the tighter the match, the more I had to go to the bathroom. And mm. it's like I couldn't figure it out, but I just was always leaving the court. And now I know it's – because of uh, I was going through this fight or flight response. But if you watch or play a match and this happens, I would go to the bathroom, just leave the court, just say, hey, I'll be right back. I just got to you know, get some water or get fill the ice bucket, fill your ice cup, whatever. Just fi fi figure out a reason to leave the court. Take You have the time, take a couple minutes, and then get in the bathroom stall and just like talk to yourself. All right, I lost the first set. It's okay. That's it's over. I can still win this match. I had him. I was up five two. I'm clearly better than him. I just, you know, played a couple of loose points, let him get back into it. Um, and then here we go again. And let's win this in three. That's what you tell yourself. There you go. Sweet. Appreciate yeah. that. And uh oh, Gene says, My friend Teresa loved your clinic at Indian Wells. Oh, yay. Hi, Teresa was great. And Matt, and they were awesome. Yeah. Cool. I'm not surprised. That was there. the last time, you know, we we kept our clinic in Indian Wells. Yeah. Um, it, the, in, the tournament was canceled on a Monday, I believe. Our clinic was starting on a Wednesday, and like half the people were already there. And, you know, back then we didn't really know how bad it was. And it was like, oh, we're going, you know, let's just keep it. We went and we practiced. We like high fived with our elbows. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we kind of stayed a little bit further than normal. Um, I didn't hug anybody. I didn't shake hands. Um, and everybody was fine. But I feel really lucky that we got to do that because it, that was the last tennis that we all played, and and it's been it's been uh, kind of a tough since. For sure. Um, well, well, everybody, I just want to highly encourage you again to uh, get the roadmap to mental dominance uh, if you can, because you're going to be learning uh, the mental secrets from the best and most accomplished, uh, arguably, player in history here uh, in tennis. And uh, you're not only getting the roadmap to mental dominance, but you're also getting the GG method, the seven day at home volley practice program a live Q and a uh, zoom call. So really fantastic value. And also it's uh, for a limited time. Cause I think it's closing. Uh, was it this Saturday? Saturday? Yeah. This yeah, Saturday. Saturday. yeah. So yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I highly encourage yeah, it. This, this Thursday we have the, the live call. So when everybody like signed up ready to go so that we can all get on the call on Thursday. Exactly. Yeah. So you can focus to help your students yeah. as well, which is another great right. thing. So, yeah. um, yeah, Gigi, any, uh, any last tips here that, uh, you want to give us, uh, about, yeah, you know, just wanted to say to people when they, when they go back to playing again, take it easy because you've been off for two months, not playing. And you know, the tendency is to like get excited. I can play tennis again and go back to what you were doing, but you got to kind of ease, ease your way into it. A two month break from tennis is fairly long. I mean, you've lost muscle mass, you, you've lost muscle memory. You're going to have lost, um some fitness so you don't want to go out and you know go 100 percent right away and get hurt um be kind to yourself when you come out you are not gonna probably feel so good about how you're playing i remember in times when i would take breaks um four five six days breaks was really the most i would ever take um and then the first couple of days i just didn't feel good you know and uh, if you're just kind to yourself when you come back uh you know that your game is there it's gonna come back you're gonna find it uh, just stay positive and um, uh, and hopefully our paths will cross sometime in the next summer or year and everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Um, if your if your state is opening, um, keep keep practicing um, you know following what everybody's recommending and everybody please stay safe. 
That's right. So everybody, uh, thank you for coming and click the big green button down below if you're on the web page uh, or the the link to get the Roadmap to Mental Dominance plus exclusive bonuses uh, straight from Gigi, the 17 time Grand Slam champ. Uh, Gigi, thanks so much for coming on to uh, to this live stream. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, just best of luck with everything and stay safe. And thank you all as well for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.